That's good. Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter 24. Thanks for being here. We have a lot of folks already traveling for Turkey Day and uh, getting a chance to get away. We made a mistake last year. We left on Sunday night after church on the most traveled day in, and it took six hours to go one hour. But we have plenty of time to talk. <laughs> but I think sometimes there's a, a lesson in that. That we don't recognize that although we may be headed in the right direction, it's probably going to take us longer to get there than we planned on. Amen. Salvation is instantaneous. But in the latter days, the patience of the saints reigns supreme. Amen. The hard thing is, is to just continue on. You don't see what we used to see years ago. You don't see where that faithfulness is... Uh, as like it used to be. People change jobs, they change wives, they change directions, they do everything. It's as if variety is the spice of life and everything, we, gotta, we, we get bored with things too quickly. Now I'm just giving you an opinion, I'm not gonna preach on this this morning, but part of that comes from being raised in a generation where it started with televisions where you can flip past three channels and now you've got, I don't know how many that's out there now, satellite or cable or whatever, but I'm sure it's well over a hundred and you can clip through and then if you have a thing where you can ask for whatever a subscription is, you have another hundred or more that's there. And so you can change just like that. Or if you're doing the, the, the thing they call scrolling now with TikTok and Instagram and uh, YouTube and all that, you can change it just like that. I mean that quick. You get bored with it, you change it. Bored with it, change it. Bored with it, oh, like that one, watch it for a little while, change it, move it on. The problem is, is that's now found its way into Christianity. And the problem is, is that we think that the Christian walk is like that. And it's not. The Lord still does things very slow and very painstakingly. Uh, the Bible teaches you some things about having to learn to walk with the Lord, never run. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings of eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. But we have to learn to wait. Sometimes we want to get, uh, move quicker than God wants us to move. God's timing is always perfect. Amen. But what I want to try to give you this morning, and before you get to thinking too much about getting in a hurry, one of the things putting pressure on you right now is, is you're beginning to feel time close in on you. Thursday's coming. Thursday's coming. Thursday's coming. Oh my God, I haven't got my shopping done. I haven't got this. And then what will happen is after Turkey Day's done, then all of a sudden Christmas will wind up being the same thing. I don't have my stuff up. I don't have my decorations up. I don't have the gifts balls. I don't have this done. I don't have that done. What am I going to do? I don't know where we're going to go and this and that and the other. And then before long, and for some of you, maybe not that way. Before long, all of a sudden, you begin to take on what's happening and it puts stress on you for the holidays instead of being able to enjoy, you know what, I'll get up when I want to get up and eat what I want to eat and then I'll get, you know, make a New Year's resolution and lose all I gained during those holidays. What the devil wants to do is to put you under the pressure of time to try to make you go faster than God wants you to go. You have to learn to be slow and steady. Uh, comparative to an ox, not even to a mule. With that thought in mind, look if you will please, in Luke chapter number 24, we're going to pick it up in verse number 49. There's some things that you have to be willing to continue to do in order to be successful. Luke 24, verse number 49, the Bible said, And behold, I send promises of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Uh, then he says in verse 50, He led them, out of the far, uh, led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Brother Larry, you pray, will you please? Father, we come before you this morning. We're grateful, Lord, and with grateful hearts that we're able to be here. Thank you for the safety and the passage this morning uh, for each and every one of us. We pray for those now that will be listening by way of the airways. Some 
uh, as just regulars, Lord, but some are not able to be here, so they're able to. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for this ministry and the outreach of it. We pray for this hour now. <clears throat> Lord, not only are we grateful to be here, we're grateful for, Lord, your spirit and your presence in this place so often. And God, help us not to take that for granted. Thank you for our pastor, this man, God, that you've called to preach, that's going to give us the word and preach the word of God and has taught the word of God to us already this morning. I pray, Lord, for this hour, and I pray for your might on him, that you might rest upon him, God, that he may have the words that you'd have him to say, and those only, uh, God, that he'd not detour. Have to come to our hearts, God. I pray our hearts would be set and fixed, as the song said, in a manner to receive the word. Yes. For, Lord, we can be in disarray. We can be all over the place, and, and it'd be bouncing off like preacher says, BB's on a tire. But, God, help our hearts. Help our minds Amen. to be clear. Amen. Help us to receive this word and the importance and the seriousness of this hour. Lord, we're here by, we're here not, some have come, Lord, just because they veered in, Lord, maybe just those that have come as visitors, Lord, maybe been invited, those that have, have come regular, and then there's our congregation, this city of believers. We pray for each and every soul in here, and those that will be listening, that the word will be effective as it comes forth. Now, we're going to give you the glory for everything that's said and done. Might you be in everything that's said and done in this hour. In these next few minutes, help us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 As you're being seated, you turn to 1 Corinthians. Leave your finger right there because we're going to come back and look for you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is a definitive chapter there when it comes to what you're going to be like in eternity. He said, the seed that goes in the ground is not like that which comes up out of the ground. And that is sown in corruptions, raised in incorruptible, and sown in mortality, raised in mortal, and so on and so forth. You read down through there, and he talks about the celestial body and the terrestrial body, the earthly body and the heavenly body and those things. And he comes down through that passage. And then he says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed suddenly in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And then he comes down to that passage and he quotes you. It's a good funeral passage. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victim? The sting of death is the law. Uh, but thanks be unto God and so on and so forth. Look there in verse number 58. He closes out this chapter with this thought in mind. Now, judgment seat of Christ is there. Do you see it? And the fellows of the judgment seat of Christ is there. And then he says, therefore, my brother, therefore what? Therefore, in reference to where we're headed in eternity. Therefore, in reference to all the great things God's going to give you. Therefore, in reference to all the prophetic events that are going to happen in your life personally, you're going to get a new body. And you get to study in the Old Testament, you wonder what that body must have been like. Probably like transparent gold, the gold of Ophir right over there in, in uh, Eden. They don't have time to go into all that stuff. Uh, Adam and Eve lost that when they partook of the fruit there in the garden of Nate, the grape there and all that stuff. Probably what takes place. You'll get a body like Christ's body. You'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. You'll be able to have it and not just be eternal to be a glorified body. You're going to get a mind like Jesus Christ. You're going to walk on streets of gold, have gates of pearls to go through and walls of jasper. Everything you do and everything you think of will be absolutely perfect. In light of that, what's coming is what he's trying to get across to you. It should kind of make you feel like, I, I feel like I should be doing something because those are the things that are coming my way. If you're saved, that's coming your way. Now why is that important? Because if you look down, you go down. Many, many years ago, I've told you the illustration before, that one of the things they taught us when they are putting us through motorcycle school, which was two weeks of grueling difficulty, it's like going through buds training, and our teachers back then, they, they really didn't care much for being nice and kind, they didn't say please and thank you, if anything, they were a little bit rough on you, and then what they would tell you is, it's all about your head and eyes. And what they would teach you is if you look down, you go down. It's hard to, by faith, look where you're going instead of where you've been. Right. Now, one of the problems that you have when it comes to the Christian life is, is you have the tendency to look at where you're going right now instead of where you're going in the hereafter. Amen. The tendency is to get landlocked. The tendency is to pay too much attention to the things that are going on in the world today. To get caught up in all the things that are happening that you can't do anything about anyway. And somehow we've been led to believe that if I know about it, that it's going to make things better. No, knowing about it doesn't change anything. All it does is make you more anxious. 
So God's answer to that is to the Apostle Paul is this, verse 58, Therefore, in light of the things I've showed you in the 57 verses before, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always doing what? Abounding, Abounding in what? Well, that's a strange thing. I don't have to work to get saved. I don't have to work to stay saved. Why does Paul tell me to work abound in what kind of work? The work of the Lord. You say, why? That's all that's going to matter. You've heard the old preacher say time and time again, uh, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When you get to eternity, the Lord doesn't reward you for all the other things you do. Now, ladies, that doesn't leave you out. You get to participate in the ward according to 1 Samuel chapter number 30. Of everything that the king gets to participate in, you get an equitable reward to that. I don't have time to go into all that stuff, but don't think that supporting your husband who happens to be doing something for the Lord leaves you out of the equation. You're doing what God called you to do. There's too many verses in the Bible where God specifically tells you the kind of wife you ought to be. I don't know if you're that kind of wife or not. I couldn't tell you. But if you are, you get a reward for being what God would have you to be. Altar's open. You want to come on down here and just find out. I mean, if you, if you measure up, if not, then, if, then fess up and get up, if not. Listen, the modern idea of what a wife ought to be is not anything like the biblical idea of what a wife ought to be. You want to be pleasing to God to get an eternal reward? Be what God wants you to be. Stop getting caught up in all this mindset of what the world says a woman is supposed to be. The world doesn't even know what a woman's supposed to be nowadays. Uh, a woman is supposed to be nowadays confused about whether or not she's a woman or not. So how are you going to go to the world and find out what a woman is supposed to be? It'll depend on whatever woman it is that you're following or whatever a woman is if she really thinks she really is a woman. And I don't know why that happened. When the Me Too thing came along, I don't, I don't understand that. Because if they don't know who they are, how can they be Me Too? It's funny how they use that when it's to their advantage. If you're not what God would have you to be, aren't you the bride of Christ? I got you, men. Are you the right kind of wife to him? Well, if not, the altar's open. Then go ahead and get it fixed up. Don't just think that's a passage for all the women in here. That's a passage for the men in here. You say, why? We fall short too. The Lord said about some of us, He'd rather be up on the attic than to deal with a dripping faucet there in the house. Nuts, that's Proverbs. Notice he said, Be steadfast, unmovable, always amount of the work of the Lord. Uh, then he says, For as much as you know, your labor is not what? Amen. But now there's a catchphrase. In what? So would you agree with me then, based on what Paul said, come back to Luke 24, would you agree with me then, based on what Paul said, that what matters is what we do for the Lord? Now let me remove you from popular opinion. Okay, this is going to be a little bit painful for you. It does not matter what awards and rewards you get down here for your physical labors. Amen. What matters that's going to last for eternity is what you do for the Lord. That's why when you get to the judgment seat, you will see some old women and some old men being able to participate in eternal rewards while there are people that outdid them uh, head and shoulders above what they did as far as physical accomplishments on the earth. The amount of money they made, the houses they lived in, the positions that they had, the material blessings that they had, the recognition that they had, all of those things that we view nowadays and say, wow, that's real success. Real success is being what God would have you to be and doing what God would have you to do. But you don't always see a physical reward for it. The misnomer is, is we want our treasure now. Benny Hinn was said to say, and he said this several times, he said, I hear about the streets of gold, the walls of jasper, and the gates of pearl. And he looked up and he pointed to the Lord and he said, I want my gold, my precious stones, and my silver now. Well, that's a pretty arrogant statement. So one of the things that happens is, is in our mindset, we got to be careful that if I'm going to be what God wants me to be in the end of this thing, I've got to forever keep my eyes on Jesus Christ and what He wants me to do. And at that place, we're all equitable. We're all equal. We all have the same opportunity, including the kids. If you just do and fulfill what God wants you to do, you're not racing each other. You're simply doing to your greatest ability what God wants you to do. You're just as successful. Successful as the Apostle Paul. That's it. That's it. 
The misnomer is, is, well, I can't do what he did. You weren't accountable for that. You're accountable for the five or the two or the one or the ten that God gave you. Amen. And if God gave you ten and you only gave two, then you're accountable for the eight you didn't apply. Right, now you want to grab a hold of that. You say, why? It takes the pressure off of you to be something that you're not. Listen, if you've surrendered to God to go to Bible school, Brother Brad sent me a note yesterday and said we've had, since the Jubilee, we've had 20 new students sign up. Amen. Well, that's a real blessing, man. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And I don't know how many for the bachelors and all that, that's Christian studies. You say, what do you think? God called you to go to school? Go to school. Amen. You say, what do you do? You get something for it up there. It won't hurt you to go. But at least they're going to give it a shot. You say, why? The Lord tagged them and said, go to school. Everybody that goes to school is not called to preach. Everybody that's called to preach is not called to be a pastor. Everybody that's called to preach or to pastor is not a missionary or an evangelist. Sometimes God just wants you to be whatever you are, wherever you are, doing whatever it is you're supposed to do. The misnomer is it always has to be a position in a church. No, pew is a position. Are you filling the pew? That's where God wants you to be. Forsake not that you assemble yourselves together even more so, such as you see the day of promise. Let me say this to you first and foremost. Look in verse number 49. If you are going to be successful and finish the race that God, race God wants you to do, you're going to have to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice he said to send the promises of the Father upon you. Tarry here until you have been uh, endued with power from on high. Nothing worse than trying to serve God without His power behind it. Amen. There's no bigger abortion, no bigger abomination than to see people get up and try to do things that aren't empowered by the Spirit to do it. Amen. God promises you that. David says over in the book of Psalms, Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. Uh, I know this. We just had to put the car in the shop because of all the stuff that goes on. The little lights come on, the bells come on, and then they talk to you nowadays. And they give you these warnings like the car is going to blow up or pull off the side of the road and stop working or something. But it says to you, uh, you're past whatever the amount of time is for an oil change. I know this about oil. I know that if you don't change the oil, even if you're using the super infused oil, you're using the special oil, using the synthetic oil, using the oil that doesn't break down, using the oil that lasts so many. I know this about all oil and all oil products. It loses viscosity over time. Viscosity, that's just a fancy word for the thickness, the ability, the, 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 the ability to prevent uh, 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 friction. You know what happens? That stuff begins to wear down and wear down and it begins to get thin. When that oil begins to get thin, you know what happens? The rings on those pistons and the lifters on those cams and stuff that are going up and down, you know what happens? There's no lubrication there. So it begins to be like some of your knees and some of your hips. It begins to be bone on bone. Right? Whenever that cartilage was in there, you could walk and be fine. Nowadays, that cartilage is worn out. And man, when you take a step, what used to be so easy, man, I mean, it's like somebody lighting you. It's like, man, and then all of a sudden you get ready to sit down and you get up and something's stuck. Right? you got a joint right down here and it's a hip joint. You're like trying to stand up and you're like, man, what's wrong with you? So that's why some of you walk like this. It's... You say, why are you doing that? Because for you to straighten up, man, oh man, that hurts. You say, what happened? The cartilage is gone. The lubrication is gone. The thing that you're going to have to recognize is, is you're going to need God to continually fill you. Be not drunk with wine, he says, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sing into your self psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and, and those kind of things. The first thing you got to recognize is, I need God on a daily basis. Amen. I know that if I don't take the car in and change the oil, eventually what will happen is, no matter if the oil stays full, is the oil will get dirty. Now you can't dirty up the Holy Spirit, but you can dirty up yourself. And sometimes, you know what has to happen? Sometimes they have to, you know what they do? It's a strange thing to me. I've looked at it before. It's odd. They use gravity to do it. The plug's in still in the bottom. The, with all the changes they've made, the plug is still in the bottom of the oil pan. Isn't that strange? You know what they do? They pull your car in there and they wait for everything to kind of drain down to the bottom. And when they open that up, have you ever seen what's in that? That oil's just as black as the ace of spades, man. It comes, you say, why? It's wore out. 
It's been taking all the filth and all the dirt and it's been heated up and cooled and heated up and cooled and heated up and cooled. And over time, the molecular structure of it begins to change. You know what's in that oil? All the dirt, all the particles, all the friction, all the metal shavings, all the things that are microscopic in nature that you can't see. But you know this? If you don't have that oil change, your engine will naturally run more hot. Oh, give me just three shakes of a lamb's tail on that one. Amen. You are in need of an oil change when little things set you off. You're running hot. Why? Too much friction. You make a huge mistake if when you get ready to diagnose a car, you can ask Brother Larry about this later on, to diagnose a car and say, well, the car is overheating, it must be a water problem. You can have all the water and all the coolant in the world. If that oil is running low or it's dirty, that engine's still going to overheat because it's under a lot of compression. You know what happens when the oil gets loose? The engine loses compression. Can I just talk to you? Because I know you're getting this. You get ready to line up on the line. You know what you need? You need compression so that when you take your foot off the brake, that thing breaks loose and jets out of there. You know what happens sometimes? If your oil doesn't have the right viscosity, there's no compression. And you mash the gas and it just goes... And you're thinking, well, it must be the carburetor. It ain't nothing to do with the carburetor. Well, it's running hot. You say, why? Well, I've got coolant in it. I've changed out the thermostat. I've done this and done that. The temperature gauge is fine. How come there's no compression in the engine? I can tell you why, other than a busted gasket. The oil needs to be changed. It's lost its viscosity, its thickness. It's dirty. It's got a lot of metal shavings. You know what can happen over a period of time? You don't change the oil out. The things that should be taken care of, they used to call motor oil a detergent. It would clean the inside of the engine. And you say, what was the purpose? To take those microscopic metal shavings and get them out of there so it didn't scar the cylinders where the piston and the rings go back and forth. You know why your cars in the old days used to smoke like a, a freight train or like a Catholic priest? You know why that was? <laughs> That was because the oil wasn't thick enough to make up for where the rings were. And now all of a sudden the oil's slipping by that and when that spark plug hits it, it causes a fire. And that's why you got that gray or that bluish smoke coming out there. That's why they gave to you an oil additive. Do you know what that oil additive was? It was as thick as Vaseline. It was called STP. Anybody remember that? That's how to get another 100,000 miles out of your car, but don't think for a second that once you put it in there, unless your car is really hot, you will never drain that out of the oil pan. That stuff is thick as Crisco, man. I mean, it looks like possum fat. It's so thick. You say, what'd they do? They put it in there to try to give you a little bit longer on that engine because you had not taken care of the wear and tear on the engine. Can I say this to you? You've got to take care of that engine if you're going to make it to the end. You are going to have to be continually filled and refilled. You say, why? Because at the end of the day, I'm not talking about Australashantai, Untai, Bowtie, Economy, Honda. That doesn't mean anything except you need a bridal for the tongue you got in your head. What I'm talking about to you is is that after you have had an opportunity to witness, after you've overcome sin, after you've had a chance to preach, you better pull over and better park and say, Lord, you need to fill me up again and you need to give me supernatural power to make it through tomorrow. I barely made it today. Are you running hot? Yes, sir. Come on. You have a tendency to right off the bat, you boom, just explode just like that. You boom, you're just on top of it. You need an oil change. You need to be filled up. You're running a couple quarts low. Lord comes by and checks the dipstick today and pulls it out and says, man, there ain't even no oil on this thing. And all you do is just add a little oil and everything will be fine. No, you might want to just drop the drain plug, get all that filthy out of there. And fill it up with fresh oil. Amen. I mean, for me, you know what? There ain't nothing like when you reach down there and you pull out that dipstick. And you look on there and you can't hardly tell whether or not the oil's in there or not because it's so crystal clear. Amen. And you know what you're saying? Man, somebody's taking care of this. Amen. We had a little company for a while and had these, a lot of these machines had to be checked every day. <laughs> you know, one of the things we had them check on a regular basis. You say gasoline. No, it's easy to tell when you're out of gas. You know why? The engine shuts off. 
First thing you check when an engine shuts off is whether or not there's gas in the tank. We did have some people that were like, I don't know why I quit running. Uh, no gasoline, right? You don't check the oil when that's the first thing that happened. But you know what we knew to do? We knew because they would not check the oil ever because it took a little extra time. They'd check the gasoline, but they wouldn't check the oil. You run a machine like that, especially if it's air-cooled, not water-cooled, you run that without oil in it, you will blow that machine up. And when you're paying 10 and 15 grand for a machine, it can really set you back a little bit. You say, why? Just because of general maintenance. Can I say this to you? When was the last time you paused to just simply ask the Lord, are you with me the way you used to be with me? You shall receive power, he says in Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8. But you got to tarry. Sometimes you got to pull over and park and wait for him to fill up. Listen, can I say, you don't go get an oil change on the run. you got to pull over, park, and shut the engine down for them to change the oil. They don't change your oil. At least they didn't in my day. And the ones that I just had done, they didn't change the oil with the engine running. That's a good way to burn it up while you're changing it. You say, what do you have to do? Can I just say this to you? Sometimes you have to do your own self-evaluation and realize, you know something, it's been a while since I had an oil change. It's been a while. You say, why? I need God's presence. I need God's power. Look, if you will, please. Uh, we need God's peace. Look over in verse number 36. And the Bible said, Thus spake Jesus to himself, stood in the midst unto them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Can I say you need to have God with you in the last days in order to have the right discernment? In order for you to be able to... Listen, that's the Lord standing there, right? Can I say this to you? This is the second time He's there. And they still aren't recognizing Him. Pause for just a moment and think about this. Wars... Rumors of wars, plagues, unknown entities, bacteria, worrying about whether or not you have it, don't have it. Every time you get ready to the, go to the doctor, first thing they want to do is, is, have you had a COVID test? Well, whether I have or haven't, whatever I have, I need some help. So if you've had a COVID test and you're positive, nothing we can do for you. But if it's a cold, we might give you something to help you with the symptoms. Well, which one is it? See, you're, you're, you're not... You're, you're, let me, I'm making an illustration. Now, I'm not being doctor. I just want to make it an illustration. You need the ability to have some discernment. You need God to help direct you to make sure you're making the right decision, especially when it comes to that. And whether or not you should be putting up bread and, and money and burying stuff in the backyard or should be investing or not investing or, or getting ready and getting your guns and all the other kind of stuff. Uh, when all this anti-governmental stuff starts coming out of pulpits in America, not Russia... You need to be able to have the Holy Spirit tell you, uh-uh, that ain't right. Amen. No, that don't have anything to do with the kingdom that's coming. That has something to do with my own physical uh, safety. When was the last time you asked the Lord to fill you? That's not just for preachers. That's not just for charismatics. It's not for the purpose of doing anything other than, I need God's supernatural power to fill me. It's a great way to stay clean. Amen. It's a great way for you to recognize that you know what? Sometimes the corruption and the confusion and the conflict that you see going on around you, uh, sometimes all of those things have to do with the reason I'm so all caught up in that is because I just need to be filled with the Lord. The Lord had the same stuff going on when He was there and they were trying to kill Him. Right? Were they not trying to kill Him? And guess what He was worried about? They're out to get me. They're going to get me. What are they going to do when they get me? I don't know what I'm going to do. They're out to get me. Sounds like an independent fundamental Bible believing anti-government, flat earth believing person. They're, they're coming to get me. Okay, good. I'm in God's hands. I'm His kid. If He's ready for me to be God, I'm going to get God. And if He's not, I'm not. No weapon formed against me shall prosper until He's ready for it to. And if they dispatch me, better for me. 
Sorry for y'all. See you later. But God knows what He's doing. But guess what happens? We get worried about controlling our own destiny, don't we? We get worried about insuring everything that can possibly happen. But there's no way to insure against some things. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to have proper discernment. You live in unusual times. Things are really uncertain. Can I just say this to you to be very careful how I say it? Please don't split the church over whether you should or shouldn't get a vaccine. That's nobody's business. Where did the church get involved in medical stuff? I am going to say this definitively. It is not the mark of the beast. Well, how do you know that? Because I'm still here. The mark of the beast shows up in the, out in the tribulation. I'm going to be gone. How much time is left in the tribulation? Don't matter, I ain't going to be here. Don't be splitting the church over things that don't amount to a row of pins. Amen. If you got the flu, stay home. Yeah. Amen. 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 If you want to come, sit in the back. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But, but do you understand the foolishness of taking on this expertise as if you've been given some supernatural insight into making a decision that affects someone else's life. That's not any of your business. You can take supernatural intervention and in where they spend eternity. Yes, sir. But whether or not they do or don't get a vaccine, there is nothing in the Bible. The Lord comes along and says, Hey, now I'll tell you all, you better watch out for them physicians. Apostle Paul comes along and says, Man, all them doctors, white coat syndrome, man. You need to get you the eye of the bat and the wing of the newt and get you a holistic doctor. Dr. Luke wasn't holistic. He might have been holistic, but he was not holistic. <laughs> Dr. Luke was a regular doctor. And he traveled with Paul because Paul couldn't even raise his own self. Right. And Paul had enough sense. He couldn't have been a Bible believer. Paul had enough sense to go, you know what, that doctor can give me an aspirin if I got a headache. Yeah, thank God. What do you think Luke was there for? Paul said, everyone else has deserted me, but Luke's still with me. Thank God for good doctors. Amen. We went to see one the other day. She'd been sick for sinking ever. And so we went to see the doctor. I thank God the doctor sat down there, listened to what all was going on, spent some time there, listening to the symptoms and this and that, and making notes and checking this and checking that and all this and that and the other kind of stuff. And gave her some medicine. And I said, baby, you can't take that medicine. That's the mark of the beast. That's the Antichrist. <laughs> It'll be better for you to die than to take the mark. I'm like, no, we go into the drugstore and going to get it and it's going to make you feel better. And I'm going to tie you to the bed and make you rest. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you know what we wind up doing? We start making decisions that are not ours to make. And we think that it's super spiritual to interfere in other people's lives and tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Can I give you a weird one? Well, I'll take the vaccine. Okay, good. Pray over it. Maybe whatever it was going to do to you won't do it to you. Maybe, Maybe it will. I don't take the vaccine because I'm I got faith in God. We've had people that had it and didn't have it and both died. Yeah. Yeah. You say, what is that? I think last time I checked, Brother Sirk, I may be wrong now. You correct me, Bible student, so don't tackle me. But could I just say this to you? I think that's in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Right? Amen. So you know what I have to wind up doing? I have to wind up doing, hey, what's what's best for me? Right? Well, if I was you, I, well, you ain't. Mm -mm. I hate to tell you all this. If I got a headache, somebody give me some aspirin. Amen. I'm not going, that ain't suffering for Jesus. That's suffering from stupidity. If you got something to make me feel better, if it's legal, if it's legal. I saw some of you like, oh, preacher, man, I mean, I, mm -mm. I ain't taking your prescription. You ain't getting me on that one. You forget where I came from. Preacher, I got an old... Uh, mm -mm, nah, not me. You ain't going to catch me on that. But, but if I feel bad, and, and you, if I'm coughing my head off, and you got some cough medicine, now, not Uncle Bud's remedy. <laughs> you understand? I mean, some cough medicine that'll help me. I'm going to take it. You say, why? I'm tired of coughing. 
Can I just say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Having enough discernment to recognize two things. One, what's best for you and for your family. And two, have enough discernment to stay out of everybody else's business. Don't split the church over politics, over physicians. My Lord have mercy. I'm grateful He left her around. I, I, I'm just saying. But you know what? We were told you can't... Oh, don't take chemo. You'll die. But for the Lord's sake, don't take radiation. If I was you, I wouldn't have surgery. Thank you. All I know is she's still here. Amen. Now why do I think she's here? Well, because we did all of that. And all, no, because the Lord. Amen. So if it was going to hurt us, it didn't. If it did, it didn't. Whatever it might be. But... The thing is, is everybody that was giving me that advice, they didn't have to live with the repercussions of a dead woman. So we made the decisions as best we possibly could. She hates when I do that, but that's the fact of the matter. Some of you forget that. You need to be reminded. I mean, yeah, she was right there at the door. She's going to die. That was not a fun time in our life. That was really weird. And guess what? We're still kind of recovering from that. There's a lot of stuff that goes with all that. Here's the point. You end up getting cancer, don't, don't come come. We'll tell you how you get through whatever decision you're making, but I ain't no oncologist. Go see a doctor. I'll pray for you. You say what? It's in God's hands. Well, I happen to know somebody and they didn't take it and they survived just fine. Okay? Hallelujah. You know, they took peroxide and bleach and... Threw salt over their shoulders, spun around twice, stood on their head, and you know, they all ate all organic. You want something weird? We've been eating pretty much all organic, still got sick. Amen. The Bible says every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if we receive with prayer. Whatever you do in word and deed, do all to the glory of God. That's in God's hands. I don't mean to get carried away, but I am trying to warn you. Because of social media nowadays, for some reason, you feel it is incumbent upon you to have an opinion about everything. Think of the social issues that were around when Jesus was around. If you think you're a hub for social media, that's God manifest in the flesh. He knew the very thoughts of everybody that was there. How much was he wrapped up in it? Some of you use social media as a weapon. And you hurt other people with what you say. And you don't care. Because it's all about you. Can I just say this to you? When it comes to those things, if you'll ask God first, you might be surprised how much you'll just butt out. Let God take care of it. Well, preacher, we happen to know things about... Okay. You didn't get it from me. But whoever gave it to you, what was the point of whatever they gave it to you? I guess we better move on. The reason some of you don't have any peace is because the King of Peace is not reigning in your heart. I didn't say you weren't saved. So you have no peace. There's constant turmoil in your life. There's constant conflict in your life. There's constant trouble with everybody in your life. And you know what you refuse to do? You refuse to look at the common denominator in all of that trouble. It's you. Boy, you can get them to shout and can you get them quiet? I guess so. <laughs> it's not always everybody else. Number two, there's only 20 of these. We'll be done quick. Look in verse number 50. If you're going to make it to the end of the things, you not only have to be continually filled, you're going to have to continually follow. Look in verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted his hands and blessed them. Brother Sam, do you think if they hadn't have followed him, they'd have been blessed? Doesn't look like it, does it? Do you know he led them outside into a place called Bethany. That means I've got to be willing to follow Him in sor sorrows and storms and struggles, <laughs> in surprises, Amen. in things I don't get and things I don't understand. Amen. 
Let me get close and personal. Y'all are excluded from this for now. Y'all are excluded. <laughs> I'll exclude everybody. <laughs> How about in your marriage? Is it where you thought it would be 20 or 30 years ago or have things changed? How about with your kids? Are you where you thought they'd be? See, it doesn't require faith if my kids are doing what I think they should be doing. My grandkids and my great grandkids, that doesn't require no faith at all. I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm a great parent, grandparent, great grandparent. Pawpaw's the bomb. Until he ain't. You ever have things surprise you that you didn't expect? You go to the doctor. All of a sudden you get served with papers. Something changed, something twisted, something... just like, I don't even know how this happened. What I'm saying is, is that we have to make a decision first and foremost to follow the Lord wherever He leads. I will... Boy, that's hard. If a man will follow me, he has to hate mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, children, yea, his own life also. Not in the sense of despising them, but putting God first. I've got to be willing if I'm going to be successful to let the Lord follow. And guess what? Sometimes it's going to be outside of the norm for what everybody else wants to do. They might consider you as a Bible believer to be a weirdo. You know what's strange to me? I see courage in queers. I know you're... I know you're I mean, hold on, preacher. No, 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 no. They have more courage than Bible believers because they don't care if you call them queer, weird, unusual, odd, strange, lesbo, whatever it might be, or unknown. They don't care. They're willing to take the hit. But a Christian to be called a Christian, well, I'm not really, I mean, I'm a Christian. Well, I, I am, I'm, I'm saved, but I'm not like, well, I mean, what do you mean by the word Christian? I mean called out. I mean not of the world. I mean, I think differently. I believe in a soul authority. I mean, I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I do that because that's where God told me to go. I'm following Him. But He don't always lead us to popular places. And it doesn't always make us popular with others. So when I say the statement that I made, they're not ashamed of that. They're wrong, 100%. But why do they have more courage for a cause that's going to put them in hell and we have the right cause and yet we're kind of like, well, I don't know. I just, I don't want to be offensive. They're not even worried about being offensive. If you were around or even saw pictures of the rainbow thing they did here in Duval County and the stuff they passed out here in Duval County to kids here in Duval County. Did you even know that went on? How filthy it was? You used to could not even buy that stuff except downtown behind the green door. I'm talking literally filthy, lewd, pornographic material given out for free. Along with... Uh, but at any rate, here's... Listen, they didn't care. But you know what? You have the gospel of peace. It's like, well, I don't really want to leave a track. I'll be offensive. They didn't care who they offended. It didn't bother, it didn't bother me at all. Listen, if I caught somebody with a sack full of that stuff in my day, I would immediately say, hey, that's a pedophile. They're here to cause a problem or trouble. They're passing out stuff. Literally, a turn your stomach. In Duval County, publicly, and it was promoted by the media. Your governmental officials were there to join hands with them with the exception of some who said, uh-uh. Well, you're not going to be popular. I don't care. But I'm saying that, you know what we do sometimes? We're kind of ashamed of that. That's why I see courage in what they do. Can I say this? Sometimes... You've got to trust the Lord in the storms. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
There's not a Christian yet I know of that hadn't been in a storm. You know what I have to learn to do? I've got to continually follow Him. No matter how bad it gets, I've got to know He's going to get me to the other side. Amen. You're going to need that in the last days. Amen. What are you doing? I'm, I'm following Him. Where He leads me, I will follow. Number three. We can verse number 51. And it came to pass, and it usually will, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into... I'd like to say this, we're using S's, but continually focused on the sky or on his return. You know, the problem can be that when you get into situations or problems here on the earth, we get landlocked and those problems become huge. They come to the point that we make a big thing out of something that's going to burn. And you realize it can be a test that the Lord say, why are you so hung up on this, caught up in that? Why are you so... A lot of times it's driven by reputation. A lot of times the devil uses our pride against us. Can I get a witness? Amen. Help me just a little. It'll go back quicker. But, but can I say this to you? That Bible said, having the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, thinking about the judgment seat of Christ is something some of you, until you came here, you had never even thought about that. You knew when you died you were going to go to heaven, okay, so on, so, but you never thought about, how's it going to be when I stand up there knowing the terror of the Lord? I'm not going to hell. But that passage isn't even mentioned with hell in mind. It's the judgment seat of Christ for Christians. But sometimes we get landlocked, don't we? I mean, it's easy. All of a sudden some tragedy happens and we act as if the world is going to end because this tragedy occurred. I'm not saying that the tragedy is not something worth recognizing, but to get fixated on it pulls your eye from up there to down here. That Bible says, He that haveth this hope in him purifieth himself. You know what the hope is? Jesus Christ coming to get you. Yes. Amen. If you're going to make it, you can't lose focus on one day He's coming to get you. When's He coming? I don't know. There's some people that are no longer here with us that have died there in the ground. I never thought they'd beat me there. But they're there. I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. I wish it would happen literally right now. Amen. Well, but preacher, you know, no, I, look, you do whatever you want to do. I'm, I'll go right now. Well, I mean, are you ready? Not as ready as I could be, but I'm ready. But pause and think about it for a minute. Now that we got the holidays on top of us and we begin to think about family dynamics and we begin to think about finances and we begin to think about putting ourselves in financial situations because we got to buy gifts Come on. Yeah. and if they get me one I got to get them one listen the purpose of giving gifts originally was is you gave without expecting anything you gave because you wanted to you love somebody you don't go give your wife something and then go what'd you get me unless you're an idiot I'm just making sure you heard that part of marital counseling. <laughs> you with me? Did you get that one? Yes, sir. Okay, just making sure. Here, here's the thing you want to recognize. We think about putting ourselves even into financial pressure because we're more worried about what people think now than what he thinks hereafter. I didn't say do or don't do the holidays. Do whatever you want to do. Well, it's the devil! Okay, good. Stay home. You know, and somebody gives you a gift, say, It's the devil! You know, <laughs> give it back to them. I mean, don't be a hypocrite. If you're going to go, go. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Be a jerk. I mean, no matter. Don't eat no Christmas dinner. Don't you dare eat a goose or a duck or a turkey. Or a prime rib. Or a ribeye. Mm, I got you on that one. Yeah, you, you hear him? Yeah, I mentioned all them other ones. He don't say nothing. I say ribeye. He goes, mmm. Did you hear it? Bo, Bo got you. 
But now listen to me. Where's your focus right now? World events? World chaos? Your own physical issues or problems? Where's your focus? Hey, if you're here and you're saved, you made one great decision. Yes, and you have something to look forward to because yes. whatever trouble you're in right now, it's going to end one day. Amen. And things will be better than That's they could right. ever be. Can I just say this to you? If you're going to make it, you're going to have to learn every now and then to pick your head up Amen. and to look for your redemption. Let me say this, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I possibly can. Look in verse 52 and 53. They worshiped him and they continually in the where. Look in verse 53. Continually where? <laughs> they were continually where? How about that? You're living in a day and time where church is beginning to be something that people don't want you to be a part of because it's inconvenient. Now you'll drive to work or you'll drive to a ball game or you'll drive to a deer stand or a bass boat or you'll go to your favorite store, wherever that might be, and that's not considered odd. But coming to church three and four times a week, you're a weirdo. Nobody's that committed, except every Sunday you can certainly be committed. What am I supposed to be committed to? The Lord said praising Him, right? right. Preaching, praying, praising. I should have another P there somewhere, but at any rate, you know what it is? Old-fashioned, old-time what? Preaching about Him. Sir, we would see Jesus. I'm trying to show Him to you. That's what church is about. You know what he says? He said continually. What am I going to do? Continue to be around the right people with the right attitude. Like it or not, these people are your family. Amen. You can pick your nose and pick your seat, but you can't pick your family. God lets whosoever will into the family. You say, what are we? We're just a bunch of weirdos. We're like a jigsaw puzzle. Every one of us has unusual cuts. And unless you put us together as part of a picture... There's no, make no rhyme or reason. You look like an abstract painting. You look like Picasso. And all of a sudden it's just a bunch of, like an ink blot. What is that? I got no idea. But if you connect that thing with all the other pieces, all of a sudden, you know what you begin to see? You begin to see a picture. And guess what? That portrait will be on every page of that book right there. Because God even takes those of us who are the base things. And He said, I got a place for you in my puzzle. But you're not unique. You're not a standalone. You're part of a bigger picture. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You why we need each other in the last days. I don't like them. Well, just trust me, everybody don't like you either. Preacher, I don't like them. They don't like you either. So you think you've convinced yourself because of the responses. The only people that are responding positively to you in social media are people that are lying to you. You're not getting the other people that are telling you you're an idiot. Those people don't respond to you. So you get this mistaken idea you're pleasing to everybody. Let me just give you a solution to that. Shut off your social media. And get in the book and see what you see in the mirror. And see how close you match Him. And if you have some work to do, then let's get busy. You say, why? Because now I'm going to get conformed to something that really matters. Because you know what? Nobody knows me like He knows me. And I can fool some people, but I can't fool Him. And you know what he does? He looks at me and he says, hey boy, you are a soup sandwich. And you've got work to do. So before you start running your mouth about everybody else, how about me and you talk? You say, what do I do? I've got to continually have that diagnostic. Give you this illustration real quick. I pulled in there the other day. Used to, you pulled up there. They raised the hood and they could look at some things down there. It wasn't so complex. Nowadays, you raise it and it's like, is there an engine under here? I don't, know. I don't even, I mean, it's like, it's, it's crazy what's under there. They don't even raise the hood anymore. 
you pull in there, they come out with this little box. It's not a, 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 a mechanic. It's a woman. <laughs> she don't turn no wrenches. Right. She don't know what main fairing gator rod from anything else. She comes out there. I'm not making light of it. She's got a little box. I said, what's that? She said, this is the diagnostics for your car. I said, okay. She reached up underneath the steering wheel. She plugged the thing in there. Uh, your car is over 50,000 miles, and so therefore you're due for the following things like this. And if you'd like, I'll send you an email or a text that will tell you the things that are necessary for you to have done. And, oh, I feel like I'm in a doctor now. You know how they go, oh, and you're doing really good here. Oh, did you just find a cavity? What, it, what, what, what was the O for? Oh, never mind. Oh. And then she goes, oh. And I said, well, what does that mean? She goes, uh, I'll let your technician send it to you. I said, well, what are you? I feel like I'm in an operating room now. It's like, I'm going to die. You're going to take my car out back and shoot it. I mean, what? <laughs> Next thing I know, here's a guy. He comes out. He's like surgical. He's like bubble man. He's got all this plastic wrapped around him. He drapes it over the seat and everything. He puts it on the floor. And he said, we'll take it from here. And he drove off with my car. <laughs> And I'm like, but I don't even know what's wrong with it. We'll send you a text. I'm like, do I not need to be driving when you send it to me because I'm going to wreck? But it's changed. But here's what I got. A lot of times people look at me and they think they know what's wrong with me. And the Lord takes the diagnostic tool mm -hmm. and he plugs it in and he goes, uh, you're due for service. You're over 50,000 miles. You need to, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, Lord, what's wrong? Uh, <laughs> I'll send you a text. <laughs> I'll send you an email. I'll send you a letter. I'll send you a diagnostic report. I'll let you know what the cost is going to be to make the repairs and get you back on the road. You know what I need? Just like my car has to be serviced. Do you know why I took it in? There's nothing wrong. It was running fine. All these stinking little lights are coming on, telling me I'm past due for these things. But it was running fine. Because there were things going on that they know that preventative maintenance on, will prevent further mechanical fails. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Nothing they're doing is anything but preventative maintenance all from a diagnostic tool. You need to plug in. Some of us have been, thank you LW, some of us have remembered the illustration about the vacuum cleaner. We have a lady, I thought we were high cotton because we got one of those lithium battery things. It makes marks on the rug so you think that it's sucking up the dirt and there's little things flying around inside there so you're thinking it's doing pretty good but here's what I learned <laughs> that can be deceiving because it doesn't have the power that one plugged in the wall does so if you really want it clean you need to go old school and plug one in the wall in order to get the deep down dirt. Amen. Not just the surface dirt from tracking in every day, but the stuff that's down in the carpet. So I had to park the battery and get me one that plugs in. 
Can I tell you this? I got used to the one that plugs in because I could almost do the whole house on one charge. Not knowing that the, it was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And it wasn't doing the job it was supposed to. Now it takes more time. It does a lot better job. Amen. 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 Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.